posted you can work through it um, work through it we'll get to dependent events <clears throat> so why do we worry about dependent COVID-19, uh, testing for IgG antibodies, all right? Uh, when you look at performance measure, you say, you can see these reports as sensitivity and specificity, all right? Sensitivities and, and specificities. What are those? Well, sensitivity is actually detecting, in case if you do have it. Specificity is correctly not identifying it when you don't have it, all right? So we're kind of dealing with like, you know, true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives, and so forth. And these two things kind of go together because your likelihood that you test positive depends on your condition. So if you actually have it, there's one probability that you're going to test positive. If you don't have COVID, there's another probability that you're going to test positive. That's a dependent event, all right? And that affects then that overall question of, well, what's the chance that you actually have it? Because you can test positive and not have, not have the, the virus. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at some of these tests as practice, but before we get to those, we're gonna start with some other basic examples. All right, so first up is hair color. Hair color and eye color. You've seen this in genetics class, you've probably talked about it in our intro biology class, where these two genes are linked, right? So if we just go look at an individual and we see their hair color, you know, just, we don't, we can't see their eyes yet, maybe they're out wearing sunglasses, all right? We grab an individual and just based on that eye color, we can assign a probability of them having brown or blue eyes, right? And that probability varies based on what color hair they have, all right? So, Let's say we have just a default chance of drawing a blonde individual at 25%, and we have a default chance of drawing a brown-haired individual at 75%, all right? So we've got blonde, and we have brown, all right? And then if we have brown eyes, all right, the chance that we have brown eyes is 7 eighths. So we can have brown eyes, or we can have blue eyes. So 7 8 for brown, and that means we have 1 8 chance for blue. Let me move this camera here a little bit closer. There we go. All right, so we said brown was uh, 3 fourths, blonde was 1 fourth. 
right? If we have blonde hair, our brown eyes is 1 8. That means our blue eyes is 7. So you can see the probability of having blue eyes or the probability of having brown eyes depends on this first case. That is a defendant. This is a dependent variable or a dependent probability. I wish our lights were a little bit better. Those of you watching, add that's better. So one fourth bond. All right, so we have a probability tree. That's what I made. So now we want to calculate the probability that we are blonde and blue eyes. All right, so that's easy. Again, with the probability tree, we just multiply along our path. This is 1 fourth times 7 eighths, which is 7 30 seconds. All right, which that's the easy part. But then we go to the second question. What's the probability that our individuals have blue eyes? So now what we're, we're looking at is, is this. We can have either blonde hair or we can have brown hair, but we want these blue eyes. So in order to get up our, our probability, we have to multiply along this path to get 3 30 seconds for this one. So 3 fourths times 1 8 gives us 3 30 seconds. And then that probability of just blue eyes represents either this case, blonde and blue, or brown and blue. So 7, 10, 30 seconds, which you can simplify to 5, 6, All right, that's, an, a, that's a dependent event. That's how we would work those dependent events. Sorry. Sorry, those at home. Five, six, they can catch it. All right. So here's our application. Here's our application of it. And I've already started to allude, allude to it. We have a health test. And I think some of you will be part of this. All right. Maybe as a, as a nurse, maybe as a doctor, all right, maybe as a patient. You're going to have a test. Test comes back positive. And you're going to ask that person, well, okay, well, the test came back positive. Well, what's the chance that I actually have that condition? And they may incorrectly give you a response. All right? They may scare you. Say, you know, hey, you have, you know, well, the test is 95% you know, accurate. And if it comes back positive, hey, that's 95% chance. But that's not correct. Because the accuracy refers to both true positives and true negatives, all right? But that's not what we're interested in. We're only interested in that one case where we do test positive. What's the chance that we actually have it? So what we can do is look at these terms, specificity, sensitivity. This tells us how our, our test actually performs. The sensitivity of a test is our proportion of true positives. Sensitivity down here is our true positive. So we have our actual condition, where we actually have that, that condition, and the test result comes back positive. That's our true positive. Sensitivity measures that. The specificity is the true negative. So we don't have the condition, and the test still comes up negative. So what we don't want to do is detect something else and report it as a positive. Then we have these two other terms, false positive and false negatives. So a false positive is when we don't have the case, yet the test returns a positive. And a false negative is when we do have the case, but the test returns a negative. Now, these are all probabilities. These are all proportions. So the proportions are going to have to sum to 1, but they only sum to 1 across our rows. So if we have the condition, if we are positive, then we're looking at probabilities this way across the row. So the sum of our false negative and the sensitivity is going to equal 1. Basically, you have a condition, you either test positive or you test negative. Some of those two events have to equal 1. If we don't have the condition, we're either going to test positive or test negative. Some of those have to equal 1. We don't 
do the columns. We know that the columns won't equal to one. So example is a herpes blood test. All right, why do I have the herpes blood test up here? Because the herpes blood test is one of these quick tests that is performed at the blood donation center. All right, it's a cheap method. It very quickly screens the blood and lets the phlebotomist know, hey, your blood can be used and could be donated. All right, if it comes back positive, then they automatically just kind of throw out your blood and send you a little notice that says, hey, go talk to your, go talk to your doctor. Have this blood test and screen for STDs. All right. Uh, how good is this test? Well, I have it up here. The test is 91% sensitive. It's 92% specific. So what do those terms mean? What is this 91 sensitive? What does that mean? What is it? Okay, so if you have actually have herpes, then 91% chance that it will test positive, that you will come back positive. What about 92% specific? What does that mean? What is that 92% specific? What does that mean? Yeah, okay, so if we actually don't have herpes, then we have a 92% chance that the test comes back negative. All right? This is very different from an accuracy of a test. All right? And unfortunately, that is very, it's, it, it, people confuse those terms. All right? It's a little bit better. I've seen some information about these COVID tests appear in the news. The person is like, it's sensitive and it's specific, and they give the values. And I just, I just know that the, whoever's the newscaster, whoever's reporting it, probably have no idea what those mean. <laughs> right? It's, it's like sportscasters where they say, he's out with a contusion. I just love to ask, what is a contusion? <laughs> right? How many people know? You know? And then you've got Joe Blow over there drinking a six-pack going, he's out with a contusion. Really? What is that? <laughs> Anyways, yes. Okay. So, 91 cents. 91% sensitive, 92% specific. The thing we have to know about this test, about trying to come up with this probability that we actually have it if we test positive, is that we have to know what proportion of our population actually has this, this virus, all right? So what I found for the herpes blood test, it, it, it's testing for herpes simplex virus, all right? And I, we have information about herpes simplex virus, you know, complex one. HSV-1. 57.7% of the population has it here in the United States. Surprise? It seems like a lot, right? Seems like a lot. So we're going to address two questions. We're going to answer two questions. First, what's the probability that we're going to get a positive test? Just straight up, not even concerned if we have it or not. We just want to know, if I go in and take the test, what is my base chance of testing positive? All right, and then question two, if we do test positive, then what's gonna be the probability that we are actually infected, all right? And the way we approach these is using conditional probability. So our probability that we test positive, we're gonna calculate the probability that we test positive if we actually have herpes virus, and we have to calculate it if we don't have the herpes virus. And then we've set up two different mutually exclusive events, right? We can't both test positive and negative, right? So we're gonna calculate the probability of one and add it to the probability of the other, and that gives us our total positive. And then, out of these total positives, what, percent, what proportion of those were when we were actually infected with the virus? That's what we're interested in. What's the probability that we are infected given that we test positive? That's what that pipe symbol is meaning. All right. So what is the probability that we actually have this virus given that our test is positive? Now, we're going to use Bayes' theorem to address this. All right. Bayes' theory, theorem is a theorem of conditional probabilities. It's all that it is. Some of you may have encountered uh, Bayesian statistics. It's conditional probabilities. All right. 
where our, our chances, our event, depends on what has happened in the past. There's two things with this, two equations. The base equation is this. So the probability that A happens, given B, is equal to the probability that we have A, and then once we have A, we, we get B, divided by the total times that we have B. That's kind of confusing. And then what I did for the second way is took probability B, and that's this way. All right? So what we're going to do is kind of revise it. We're going to revise this mathematical formula utilizing a more useful form based on tests, based on medical tests. All right? So those of you that are at home, close your eyes as I move this camera. So this gives us the overall probability that the test positive. It is composed of the times we have the virus and the times we don't have the virus. So then, what 
this probability says is we are going to have it and test positive. And we want to know what proportion of that is of all the times we do test positive. All right, I think this is probably a better way to kind of get in the nose and kind of work through the problem. Alright, so let's go back to our herpes example. Alright, we said sensitivity did we say it was 91%? Alright, so our herpes example 0.9 that goes there. And that means then that a false negative is 0 0.09. What's our specificity? 0.92, which means we have an 8% false positive. Alright? The probability that we actually have probability is based on our population. We assume that we are representative of the population. We said that in the U.S. we said it was 0 0.577, right? 57.7%, right? It's in the U.S. population, 57.7% have this HSV1, all right? So we want to know, if we test, what is the chance that we're going to test positive? Well, we're going to use this equation. All right, so the probability that we test yes, that's going to be 0 0.577. And then, if we actually have it, what's the chance that we test positive? 91%. Then we're going to add it to the times we don't have it. So how do we get our no? 1 minus 0.577, which is? 56% chance of actually testing positive. What proportion of those are due to us actually having it? So it goes to the yes, 0.577 times our 0 0.91. Okay. And what do we get?
me check, make sure they have that. Let's see if there's other questions. All right, so what affects this probability? What affects this probability? So I'll tell you that this number is just throughout the entire US population. Throughout the entire US population. What if we had a bunch of high school seniors who do their, their blood draw? Right? That's the first time I ever done. High school, high school blood draw. Didn't really understand, understand it back at that time. They dropped the blood in like some liquid solution to see if your blood had enough iron. Yeah. Alright. Do you think the probability of testing positive is going to be that high for that, for that group of students? Probably not. All right, so let's change it. Let's say instead of 0.577, let's just X this out and say we have, let's say just 10%. I don't know, that might be high, that might be low, I, I don't know. Let's just say in that high school population, I think you have to be 18. We'll say 18, 19 year olds, high school seniors, 10% chance that HSV is actually in that population. How does that affect our numbers? Well, it changes, right? So we change that to 0 0.8. We change that to 0 0.9, all right? That number's gonna change. That number's gonna change. That number's gonna change. Update it. And that means we're gonna get a different value. So go ahead. Substitute that point 0.1 in all these different places and see what our actual probability of having it if you test positive. Let's see what we get. What's the probability that we actually get a positive test in this population? Is that this this or that here? All right. So that's the chance that we actually get a positive test is going to be 0.163, just based on based on probability. And then after we substitute everything in, so this goes one. Our new probability is 0 0.558, 558. Look, a huge drop now. We got it. And it's 56. That's 44% chance that you actually don't have it if it comes up positive. Why? Why the big difference? One, that base changed. But what effect did that have? What effect did that have on, on this probability? Well, filter down. Before we had 57% positive, right? And of those, we're getting 91%. But probably more important is this. 42% of our tests were going to come back, or 8% of this is going to come back as a false positive. As a false positive. Right. We've changed, instead of 8% of 42, it's 8% of 90. Right. All of those 90% of individuals that didn't have it, 8% of them are going to come back positive. A much larger proportion of our total positive. 
the tests are, are being caused by that false positive, which overall lowers the actual probability that we have this condition given that we actually tested positive. So our, this question, this one that we are really interested in, is really going to be dependent on the underlying digital frequency in our populations. Now we can improve, right? We can alter this probability based on our populations and stuff. So maybe 57.7% wasn't a good estimate to use for a high school population. Okay, we adjust it, right? And that means then that this test really isn't that good, right? Maybe we have to adjust it for, you know, if we say older individuals, they live you know, longer, maybe that, prob that probability is gonna be much higher. We should adjust this value. You always have to look at what, what the population is that you're studying to come up with that, with that number. Why do we present this one? <laughs> Personal story. But my dad donated blood numerous times before. He's got O negative, so they, they always they, they always like call him. Hey, donate, donate. Okay. Actually, O positive. Okay. Well, donate. Right. O positive. They always do. Universal donors. Other than that positive part, uh, donated numerous times, and all of a sudden came up one test that came up positive and excluded him. Then the learner said, "What the hell?" Uh, he's not in his twenties at that point. He's fifties, forties, fifties. Quite a bit, and of course, my mom will protect the learner. So it goes to the doctor, and the doctor like, "What the hell is?" This is stupid, and the doctor relayed some information. And of course, the doctor was kind of correct uh, in what he said. But this test, this HSV test, is kind of a quick and dirty test. It's a cheat test. All right? Just because you test positive doesn't mean you actually have it. But the better test is much more expensive. And you think Blood Donor Center wants to use that much more expensive test just to improve their accuracy? No. If you throw out, let's say, 5% of blood just because of, it, of bad results, hey, that, that's fine. They consider that you know, a cost of doing business. But it's cheaper to do that than to pay to have every single blood sample tested with better test. Did he let him get retested? Well, he went back to, went back to his, his doctor. And I think he had, then he had to carry the note saying, I've already been tested. It's one of those things where if you've already been tested, it's probably better. If you came back positive for something, it's probably better not to donate because you'll probably always come back positive. So what triggers it? This test can can pick up a, a just a common virus that can get from common cold. So that's probably what happened. That he had a cold, developed some antibodies to it, uh, and that's what that's what this test picked up. So it was a it was a false positive. He had cross reactive. What else can go wrong with this test? These numbers, false positives, false negatives. All right, we consider them to be fixed for a test, and they should be, but human error can really throw things off. But we've seen that. We've seen that. This code. All right. So let's do COVID test real quick. Me shrink this up and oops, hold on. So I do have, I will tell you. So we've got two other tests that, that we're going to do. I'm going to introduce these real quick. All right, so the quad test is a test that happens. Um, Twenty weeks, I believe. All right. Uh, it's a test of no. Take that back. Uh, you go in twenty weeks to do some blood blood tests and stuff, and come back with this base idea of uh, is it yeah? Does it look like you have a chromosomal deficiency in a developing embryo, developing fetus? Uh, and sometimes the doctors would recommend going through and uh, had running this quad test to see if 
if that developing fetus actually has uh, Down syndrome. All right. Uh, issue with this that you can't really do this until the second trimester. trimester all right, and it's a it does carry some risks to actually do the test. So anytime doctor would come back and say, hey, I think you should probably have this test. You you may have, you know, your your child may have Down syndrome. You kind of have, you know, I don't think that doctors necessarily explain the risks, explain the risks to you. Uh, we kind of avoided it because our kids are all like at like the bottom end of the spectrum on their size. Uh, but I had a, a friend that I worked with at, at the hospital. His his close high school friend was like six five, six six. Uh, he married a girl that was like six five, six six. So they're at the very top of the spectrum. And one of the things, that the measurements, they came in like the the spinal cord measurement suggested that perhaps the child may have Down syndrome, and they actually recommended. I think you should go get this test. All right, even though you kind of look at it, and that's they were smart enough and said, look, we're at like the upper 90 some percentile in, in us. What makes you think that our kid won't be at the upper 90 percent? <laughs> and, and they were. But the quad test is can be used at the, at the that second trimester. And these are the stats. So 81 percent sensitivity, 5 percent false positive. If we have Down syndrome occurring at 14.47 out of 10,000 births, so a, a, a probability of 0.1447%, uh, then what's our probability of Down syndrome if the test is positive? I'm going to ask that you kind of do this one uh, over the home, over the break, over the weekend, and we'll go over this on Monday. Codes are microplate, EIA, cocaine, oral fluid kit. I am going to tell you how to get out of a out of a traffic stop. All right. So on this on this kit, this is one that was actually probably not. They probably don't don't use it. I have citations down here. Uh, you can check it out, but a uh, kit was being marketed to get for the police to carry it in their car. So if they think you're driving under the influence, but you know you test out at zero for for blood alcohol, all right, maybe you're under you know influence of cocaine. It was an oral swab, all right. Ninety-two point two percent sensitive, eighty-four point four percent specific, uh, all right. And in the study that actually reporting some of these numbers. Checking their, their ability, they had 602 cocaine negative and 866 cocaine positive. So uh, this is also two questions, kind of gives you practice. Let's quickly go over one of these COVID cases. So these are all serum tests. All right, these are all serum tests. Let's find it. I don't know which one is being done at any of these drive through clinics. Uh, let's see. All right, so let's say we have, this is our sensitivity and specificities. So 98.1, 98.6. All right, we're testing antibodies. Uh, and high, through, high through throughput assay. All right, what we want to know is uh, if this test comes back positive, then what's the chance that I actually have you know, COVID-19 or had COVID-19? Uh, I don't know what the blood donor center actually uses but we can use this as an example. And we'll just make up some numbers as to the proportion in our population. So let us assume that those are the numbers that we're working with. Those are numbers that are given in our problem. So we start off with Sensitivity is 98.7. Is that right? 98.7? I think it's 98.4. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's it be that specificity is ninety eight point. All right. So we've got those. All right. We can. We the only really other one that we need is that false positive rate. All right. And we can do that just by doing our, our one minus nine eight six. Zero point oh one four. All right. And the yes. Uh, that's our false negatives. So zero point oh one nine. All right. So. We're going to have to come up with just a probability of having it. And this is going to change. This will always change. So we're just going to take a, take a sample of time. We actually don't know what the true, what the true probability is. We have estimates. The estimate is like we have anywhere from about 30 to 40% of our asymptomatic. Right? That wouldn't show it, but they should develop antibodies to that. So let's say our proportion we're looking at is is at 40%. Zero point. We'll start there. So what we have to do is we are curious. We want to know what's the probability that we actually have it if our antibody test comes back positive. That's what we're interested in. So first thing we do is come up with the probability that we test positive. That's going to be the probability that we actually had, had it and tested positive. And the probability that we didn't have still test positive. So 0.4 times 0.981 plus 0.6, so 60% chance that we have it in the of that 60%, we will test positive 0.4%. So our probability that we get a positive test in this case is going to be 0.4 times 9.8 plus Given we tested positive. Well, that's going to be this part. We want the proportion of this part of the total. So 0.4 times 0.981 over 10,000 people, X number tested positive, yeah. or X number actually had it. Then you calculate. But yeah, that has to be given in the problem. And then one or two of these have to be given. But you have to have one of these in each row. Right? One in each row. So you can be given the sensitivity and the false positive. You can be given the specificity and the false negative. You can be given false positive and false negative. You can be given sensitivity and specificity. All right. So knowing one in a row allows you to calculate, to calculate the other. So in this case, yeah, and for this test, if we assume 40%, if we test positive, then yeah, the chance that we have it is going to be almost 98%. But for this frequency, this 40% goes down, that's going to reduce this. Because now we're, we're, we're having a larger percentage of false positives in our total standard. If this number goes up, then we're going to get much better at detection. And that's kind of what happened early on. Early on, when you hear about all these, these positive tests, it was a mix of bad lab practices, it was a mix of contamination, and then it was also a mix of this number being really low in our population, 
and our false positive being higher. That's really what's driving a lot of these false positives. We catch it in the news, and unfortunately, it kind of allows people to take it completely out of hand and out of whack. They let it into the government. What you do is basically any test. Any, any test. So, you know, if you end up getting tested, some way, you know, and you ask, well, okay, well, if it comes back positive, what's the chance that I could have it? How we do? And it tells some flip side. So if it comes back negative, what's the chance that I actually don't have it? Right? It works the other way. It just works the same idea. We do the proportion of negative tests, and we figure out what proportion actually corresponds to the negative test. Right, so we've got the two problems that are posted. I want you to work through those over the weekend, kind of give practice. On Monday, we'll review them, we'll work through them, and then we'll also, I have some other ones later. The most common one are those for dollar general pregnancy tests. They're a dollar, right? Is it worth it? It's a dollar versus like a 20 or $40 pregnancy test. Because I don't know, you've seen the HEB ones? You might still all be a little young, but I was stunned when my wife came home with $20. <laughs> All right, we'll check. We'll check this. Are they good? Or are they bad? There's some animation. All right. Uh, I will say that a couple years back, we, we, we were talking about it, and it was uh, we we're at the time where we're matched up with grass with our grasshopper marker capture lab. Some of you have had that lab where we mark grasshopper and use fingernail polish. So I had to go to the, the dollar store to get more fingernails. And the person in front of me was buying three pregnancy tests. And I wanted to say, look, you only need one. <laughs> you only need one. But human error is a big, a big source. A big source of error. All right. You guys have a good weekend. Don't forget to work on just these practice problems. And we will work through those as a class again. More of the same. All right, y'all have a good, good